This uh, session is titled uh, The Port Huron Statement, 50 years later, a factually accurate uh, observation. And uh, I'm uh, Paul Buell, and this is Tom Hayden. And uh, I think the way we'll do this is uh, I will sort of speak just a little bit about what the Port Huron Statement meant for we younger SDSers. Uh, and, uh, and introduce Tom a little bit, although I'm sure he needs no introduction to this audience. And uh, then I will uh, turn it over to him, and uh, perhaps uh, as we go along, I'll uh, handle the questions and, uh, and, and comments and uh, throw anybody out of the room who gets really violent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, perhaps I should say that, that uh, I may need a little introduction. I, uh, was publishing a, an SDS magazine called Radical America in Madison in the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, and after a long time uh, college teaching, retired back to Madison, my adopted hometown, and began publishing uh, radical comic books aimed at young people. And uh, one case in point is Students for Democratic Society, uh, which Harvey Picar and I and a bunch of artists collaborated on. Uh, several years ago at the moment when it appeared as if Students for Democratic Society was going to be revived and alive a second time. That didn't quite happen, uh, but nevertheless, the, the dream persists. Um, I've been telling students uh, all those intervening years until I retired that the Port Huron Statement was the most significant political statement of social change, social transformation in the 1960s. Uh, and there hasn't been anything that's been its equivalent since in terms of being utterly unique and uh, most especially a generational voice of what terrible is, is happening <coughs> in society and how urgently many people who are not organized by anything but especially young people felt the need to uh, make a sweeping change and the need to uh, empower themselves uh, not to be outsiders, uh, uh, meaningless uh, uh, goers to various things, uh, voters, and so forth, not quite meaningless, but powerless to affect the kind of changes that they had in mind. Now, uh, as I uh, assigned chunks of the Port Huron Statement to my students over those decades, uh, I would generally say that it's outside of all of the given major ideologies. Uh, it, it was neither uh, liberal, by that I mean the standard uh, Cold War liberalism of the 1960s and later and today, uh, nor was it conservative by any stretch of the imagination, nor was it Marxist, nor was it existentialist, uh, nor was it definable by any fixed sort of boundary. And in my uh, estimation, that was an enormous strength of, of the document. Uh, it eluded easy identification, but it spoke so uh, uh, wonderfully to me as I bought my 25 cent copy at the literature table of SDS in the fall of 1965, a few months before SDS's, uh, uh, SDS led uh, anti-war campus meetings, uh, uh, that I knew immediately that this was the, the statement, the document for me and other veterans of the civil rights movement to grasp. Uh, uh, to uh, help to uh, emancipate Americans, uh, uh, not only from some oppressive class, but also from themselves. To help them get over the delusion that the United States needed an endless, endlessly growing empire in order to survive, uh, and to uh, assist them to come to grips uh, with uh, what they might do themselves. Uh, my favorite uh, Wisconsin professor, William Appleman Williams, the great scholar of empire, used to say if Americans ever get tired of uh, changing the entire world, they have a fallback. They can change themselves, uh, <laughs> which uh, I always thought was pretty shrewd. Now, there's only one uh, a distaff note, and I'm not sure it is one, and that is that the Port Huron Statement was absolutely, totally generational. It spoke to a generation. As I marched with all of you, or all of you from Madison, around the square as the rest of you saw these events on, on uh, YouTube and so forth from February until May, uh, there were, I was surrounded by an awful lot of gray heads, not to mention the bald heads. And I had the feeling that the Port Huron Statement 
read by those people was still a generational statement. It's just that the, we had grown uh, 50 years or so older. Uh, but I don't think that that's uh, uh, such a, a vital point in considering the Port Huron Statement. I believe, in fact, that there's a direct line from the Port Huron Statement to the social movement that's been in Wisconsin since February. Uh, again, outside of existing ideologies, uh, uh, wishing to save America from itself and for itself, and uh, uh, getting beyond uh, all of the uh, usual muddling questions. How can we hold on to our national security? And how can we deal with those restless immigrants and, uh, and <coughs> suspicious uh, welfare uh, takers, et cetera, et cetera? Finding some way to embody everybody, really, emphatically, including the police, in a wider sense of community to save society uh, and give it a, a, a cooperative ethos, which has been so mostly, uh, most of the time, missing from our sensibility, from our lives. Uh, I and 15 others, but I'm the editor of a book coming out in December called It Started in Wisconsin, and we say we hope to live long enough to find out what the word it means. Uh, okay, Tom, now it's your turn. <laughs> just taking some notes. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, um, get this out of the way here. Let me, uh, how many of you were at the event last night? Okay, so you, you signed no, no, the email. Way around. Huh? Did it didn't make, make its way, way around? Way. No. At least it wasn't taken by only one. Okay, Steve, would you sure. circulate that? Ready? Yeah. Go. Um, okay. The, um, start that way. Okay. How much do we have till 10? 30. Oh, we've got a lot of time. Uh, okay. Um, these tables and chair arrangements have never changed in 50 years. Be my first observation. Um, so much for the democratic classroom. Uh, I. Uh, um, I guess, uh, let, let me tell you a little bit about how Port Huron happened and then what's in the statement. I, I leave to others speculation as to why it persists or, uh, or resonates. But I do agree with Paul that um, I saw uh, the spirit of Port Huron uh, in Madison this year on television from all the reports I got, and uh, I also saw it in uh, Cairo, for that matter. Uh, so there is something persistent here, and, and uh, this is the 50th anniversary. So what happened was I was, um, I was a student editor, and I was had mixed feelings about joining uh, organizations. I still do. I think when you join an organization, you become more effective in an obvious way than being alone. You have to be associated with organizations. On the other hand, you start to participate in organizational thinking. And, and organizational thinking has um, uh, nothing necessarily to do with uh, the truth or uh, factual investigation. Because once you've joined any cause or group, uh, you take on an obligation to advance its best interests. Um, just as a lawyer taking on a defendant who may be a mad defendant will put the best foot forward in the, in the, in the courtroom to try to make, make the best argument. Uh, so I, I was happy being, I was delighted being the, the editor of the Michigan Daily. And I came here and I knew the, the editors of the um, Daily Cardinal. And we thought of ourselves as the campus uh, um, opinion shaping arrogant little bastards <laughs> who kind of could weigh in to dis tell the administration what what was what about the campus and and uh, it, it, it trained me to think critically of everything around me including myself and uh, 
the activists that I was covering. But I gradually was um, transformed or changed by uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the old question of, of uh, uh, wh whether to join because it was so um, compelling and whether my uh, journalism was opportunistic in the sense that I was trying to get a byline or a story out of a, a movement where young people like myself were going to jail. Uh, and I've never solved this question, but I became more and more of a participant uh, as well as an observer, both in my organizational commitments and in my writing, and I still am a kind of participant observer. And I was in, I, I, w I was uh, commanded by Jim Foreman of the uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee to go on the last Freedom Ride in December of 1961. Uh, I believe it was December, I could be really wrong, but uh, uh, yeah, it was December. And it was, it was to test the interstate ban on segregation on, on trains. So I boarded a train with 10 other people in Atlanta, bound for Albany, Georgia. We had a merry old time on the way to um, uh, um, Albany, and the, the beauty of direct action was just revealed over and over. But in this case, here we were, through direct action, which was the only available means, we were living for a couple of hours an integrated life. Black and white together, riding a train, talking, laughing, nervously. Uh, we had done it. We had broken through the barrier, and here we were in violation of the Jim Crow laws of the time, wondering if the new federal regulations would mean anything. And we got to uh, we got to Albany, and we were arrested, and there was a big mob, and I was thrown in jail. And it turned out that the South had not heard of the Justice Department <laughs> yet. Uh, and 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 while I was in jail, I, I I wrote a letter because I was really on my way to an SDS meeting in Ann Arbor, uh, where we were supposed to decide on whether to form the organization. And, and, and my letter uh, uh, spoke to the need for some kind of vision statement. So I got out of jail, I went to Ann Arbor, and uh, we had a meeting, and at the meeting, uh, I was told that to form SDS properly, we had to have a, uh, what you call today a vision statement. A mission statement, mission. excuse me. Then uh, it was called a manifesto. <laughs> so I was, I was dispatched to write the manifesto, and uh, I, I, I uh, boarded myself up in a New York apartment and surrounded myself with a thousand or so books and started writing, <coughs> and kept writing and, <coughs> and writing. It was supposed to be um, a few pages, I guess, I don't know, ten. It became 65 or so single-space pages. And I don't know if you remember, I don't know if you're old enough to remember the Gestetner machine. It's difficult to get ink all over your hands, and it's very problematic. But we, we, uh, we, we ran off a, a, a bunch on the Gestetner and sent them out. And people were irate because they were just receiving this document two days before the meeting or five days before the meeting, and it's much too late. And what had I done? And we got there. Port Huron was chosen because the United Auto Workers had a labor camp on Lake Huron that they gave to us. This was a time when the uh, UAW sponsored SDS with $5,000 grants for our organizing work and thought of us as the coming next generation of the labor movement or the liberal left, as they as they called it. And um, so there we were in this uh, idyllic camp by the lake with uh, this document. And at, at, it was, it was, it was a, a struggle to hold the meeting, to decide to work on the document. <clears throat> we were opposed by our elders who thought that it was not anti-communist enough. Uh, <laughs> 
and uh, I was the new part of the new left. Everybody else seemed to be the child of some leftist from the 50s or 30s. I didn't know what they were talking about. I had no interest in communism, anti-communism. I didn't care what kind of communist you were. It was just like, this is about civil rights and disarmament and above all the empowerment of students. Huge fight. Finally, we get through all of this and we broke into groups. There were only 63 of us. We broke into small groups to discuss the components of the document. Values, economics, the campus today, politics, disarmament, um, and, and, and everybody was assigned to go through the document line by line and then amend it as they wished and, and revise it. For instance, I had put in a stray sentence on uh, how important I thought local private enterprise was. And this was removed <laughs> by uh, Rob Burlidge, who was chairing the uh, uh, economics workshop. And uh, everybody was quite fraternal and loving. I mean, he, he said uh, that he was proposing to substitute the language uh, of Brother Hayden with new language by Brother Karl Marx. <laughs> 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 and so it's not all of my thinking. It's uh, I, I, it, 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 it was revised uh, in in many ways, and then I was assigned to rewrite it, try to do what they call a polish today, and out it came. <clears throat> uh, and everybody felt that they had been through uh, some kind of spiritual experience or some kind of awakening. Uh, that's what happens if you stay up long enough. <laughs> it, it's true. And, and if you, and, and, and if you uh, are only children, and if you feel that you're at the center of the universe, and so on. <laughs> it could only, that's why it can't be easily uh, duplicated. Because the psychological setting was also the beginning of the 60s, which was a truly idyllic time um, before the assassinations and the Vietnam War set in. Uh, it's a time almost unremembered, uh, uh, the golden age from 60 to 62. Um, so it became this uh, document, and it has lasted for reasons I don't understand, uh, but it has lasted. The students have told me, well, this speaks to us. This is what's changed. Um, I think that it had... Uh, two or three points that I'll summarize that are worth uh, the trouble of reading through it. There's a lot of garbage in it. Uh, those are amendments that I fought off <laughs> unsuccessfully. Uh, uh, decentralized nuclear power plants in the middle of cities in order to give us a lasting source of energy would be a good starting point. <laughs> Referring to women as men would be a second <laughs> starting point. It's, a, it's, a, it's like reading uh, 17th century materials, which you know are relevant, but are kind of somewhere between quaint and reactionary. And, and, uh, but it, there was... There were three or four things. First, um, uh, th this was a departure from the left, and I think that uh, Paul is correct that it, it was more of a break from the left than the beginning of a new left, uh, although the, the left quickly caught up with it and tried to recapture it, rebottle it. But um, uh, we started, we said we have to first decide on our values, what we believe. And it became quite philosophical. What's your view of human nature was the starting point. And there aren't many political documents that start, start <laughs> on that level and work forward. And, and as I look, look back, I think there were quite a number of lapsed religious people in the <laughs> gathering who didn't really get much out of organized religion. Uh, but we're, we're looking for some kind of spiritual path. Some, some would have become uh, proponents, for example, of uh, liberation theology. Others were uh, affected by the uh, black church in the Deep South, which, uh, uh, despite our arguments about God, 
prove to be the sustaining institution for people facing death, the, the black church. So, uh, this